2 John chapter 8, it says, look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. And Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, and I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. We are in week six of this series we have entitled, There's No Place Like Home. And today I want to use for a subject, you've got mail. You've got mail. Tell someone you've got mail. You may take your seat. There is no gathering comparable to that of a healthy and productive Christian church. That in a church where the spirit moves, even when nothing is happening, something is happening. That in moments of nothingness, He heals broken marriages as together a husband and wife sing in the presence of the Lord. That in moments of nothingness, he humbles the most arrogant sinner so that he walks out of worship like a child before God. That in our moments of seemingly nothingness, He shines his light on confusion and you leave knowing the way to go. In moments of nothingness, he catches you from falling off of a cliff of hopelessness and before experience ends, your feet will feel solid on the ground again. That in these moments of nothingness, he will convict you of the ugliness of hidden habits that are quietly destroying us from the inside out. You walk out not resolving to be free, but knowing I've been made free. So the question I pose is how consistently Do you walk out of this sacred place called sanctuary feeling as though, how did my pastor know that? Or I've heard some of you say, we were just talking about that. How did this just come up this fast? Some of you text one another, OMG, I needed this. So how do you relate to a spiritual leader who consistently makes you feel as though you've got mail? Second John again says, look to yourselves that we do not lose those things which we work for, but that we may receive full reward. For no honor produces no reward. and Little honor produces little or small reward. But full honor releases a full reward. We have unpacked four divisions of authority, one being family authority. You heard what mama said. One being social authority. We'll touch on that a little next week. Civil authority. But today we want to talk about church authority. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 through 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peacefully with each other. Here's a question. How differently would you have responded today if Jesus himself were preaching and or pastoring? 
For honor is a valuing. It is something valuable, precious, weighty, authentic appreciation, esteem, favorable regard, respect. Somebody say honor. honor. I can tell a lot about where, what you honor by where you place it in your life. Again, I know what jewelry you see is valuable and which you don't by how you store it when you're done wearing it. If you just throw it on the countertop, you got it from the local flea market. If you put it back in the bag and put it in the treasure case and put it at the top of the closet, either it was a family heirloom or, or something that was precious and weighty and expensive. You can tell how a person values a thing by how they place it in their lives. I'm not naming no names. I ain't putting nobody out there. This just came to my heart to use it as, as an example. I was with somebody and I had an opportunity just to glance on their phone. I'm not being nosy. And in their uh, messages, they had p particular contacts pinned in their message. And I made the cut. <laughs> I felt honored <laughs> to be one of 13 people pinned in your phone. What honor that is. And I told them, no, just take me down. Because it looks like on your phone, you just pin everybody. <laughs> if everybody's important, then nobody's important. I mean, I, I need to be one of those few. I need to be, I need to be consecrated, set apart. You know, I need to, I need to be different. So here's the question, ladies and gentlemen. I can tell how you value me by where you place me in your life. Now, I don't want you to think I'm wearing a black suit because I'm trying to be cute. This black suit to me is the equivalent of the traditional clergy collar. So when I wear my black suit, it, it means less of me and more of him. I'm walking a fine line today, and Lord, I need all that you have. I don't know if you know the history of the clergy collar is the equivalent of a dog collar. It is to, almost to be yoked like an ox, meaning I'm tied to you. And so today, Lord, I'm tied to you. So many people could take this so many different ways, but I'm tied to you because you need to know this because if you want your full reward, part of your full reward is not just how you treat your boss. Part of your full reward isn't just how you treat your ex, but part of your full reward is also how you treat your spiritual leader. Everybody understand? So here we go. Um, the, the, the Bible communicates that dishonor is to treat as common. In your life, am I common? Am I ordinary? Am I menial? Honor can be displayed in action, deed, or thought, but true honor originates from the heart. Isaiah 29 and 13 again says, the Lord says, these people come to me, uh, come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, but I will honor those who honor me and I will despise those who think lightly of me. The principle we take away here is if I honor God, he will honor me. If I honor God, he will honor me. Because you're too smart to be so ignorant for most of us, the dishonor in our lives isn't blatant. It's covert. It's low key. If it was blatant, we'd be able to visually see it, recognize it, and call you out on it. And in most cases, it's not the blatant dishonor in your lives. It's the subtle, covert dishonor. Covert dishonor has an appearance of agreement but it settles itself to cause confusion and conflict under the radar. Covert dishonor responds in subtle senses when special giving opportunities are requested or when leadership takes a subtle shift in vision. It's the covert dishonor. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 says, honor the Lord by giving him, this is the contemporary English version, honor the Lord by giving him your money 
and the first part of your crops. Hebrews 13 and 17 says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do you realize that when you get to heaven, you have to give an account for your life? When I get to heaven, I have to give an account for my life, but also for my work. For everything that I taught you, I got to give account for. For some of you who may have been led astray because of my false teachings, I got to give account for. Watch this. So when it comes to honoring your spiritual leader, I need you to know that it's a test. You've heard this before. It's a test. The Bible says in Luke chapter 12, verse 34, your heart, contemporary English version, you might want to start reading this in your leisure. I'm falling in love with it. He says, for your heart will always be where your treasure is. So when God wants to know where his place is in your life, he follows the path of your money. So if there's minimal money going into the work of the Lord, then he has the minimalist part of your heart. For where your treasure goes, there your heart is also. Everybody with me? It's a test. Tithing is a test. Giving is a test. Being a generous steward um, of all your finances is a test. But it's not the only test. Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 40, Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, Jesus said. If if you're reading in your Bible, looking on your phones, that should be in red. That means Jesus said it. If anyone welcomes you, he welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me also welcomes the one who sent me. The message translation says this. We are intimately linked in this harvest work. Anyone who accepts what you do accepts me, the one who sent you. Anyone who accepts what I do accepts my father who sent me. Here we go. Accepting a messenger of God is as good as being God's messenger. So the Bible says when you say yes to God's messenger, it is the equivalent of saying yes to God. All right. That's the uh, CEV translation. Here's the PTV. No, this is the, uh, the, the old hood version. Have you ever been in a position where you had to go and give a message to a sibling and they wouldn't move? Uh And after reminding them three times and they still not move, then you had to communicate the authority of which you came? I'm sorry, I didn't tell you from the beginning. Mama told me to tell you. And then all of a sudden you start seeing movement. Because when you tell me no, you really tell a mama no. Because when you go and be like, Ma, he ain't say nothing. Her first question, did you tell him I said it? It's one thing when they tell you no. But when you tell them I sent you and they say no, now they got a problem with me, not with you. So God is saying, when I have placed a messenger in your life and you look at your messenger and say no, God is saying, did you tell them that I told you to say that? Because I need to know. Because when they tell you no, they're telling me no. And that's a problem. Watch this. How differently, I want to ask again, how differently would you have responded today if Jesus himself were preaching and or pastoring? This is what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 56. If I'm going to tell the truth, I got to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Isaiah chapter 56, verses 10 and 11. I'm going to read this from the message translation. For Israel's watchmen are blind. This is for those of you who have difficulty receiving a message like this because I can't trust no preachers. Don't trust them. They all dirty. They're not all dirty. There's, There's a number of them who are dirty, but they're not all dirty. This is what the Bible says about the dirty ones. For Israel's watchmen are blind, a whole lot of them. They have no idea what's going on. They're dogs without sense enough to bark. Lazy dogs, dreaming in the sun. But, watch this, the Bible says they're lazy, but they're hungry. 
But hungry dogs, they do know how to eat. <laughs> I'm determined not to be no fat preacher, y'all. I, I, I don't need to be sexy, but I cannot be fat. I just cannot. I don't. I hope I ain't offend nobody. That's just my personal thing. But hungry dogs, they do know how to eat. Ferocious dogs with never enough. And these are Israel's shepherds. And these are many of our pastors. They know nothing, understand nothing. They all look after themselves, grabbing whatever's not nailed down. This is what the Bible says of some of our spiritual leaders. John chapter 5, verse 41, New Living Translation. Jesus says, your approval means nothing to me. This is what Jesus says. Your approval means nothing to me. Jump into verse 44. No wonder you can't believe. For you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. He says, I sent some apostles. I sent some prophets. I sent some teachers, evangelists. He said, I sent them all. But for some of y'all, that don't mean nothing to me. Because you're not doing it because I called you. You're doing it to show honor to one another. And when your honor towards one another is more valuable than my call, Jesus says, I can't do nothing with you. Watch this. He says, so when you honor me, you honor Jesus. Number one. When you honor me, you receive reward from him. Number three, when you honor me, you bring me relief. So I told y'all earlier I was going to have a conversation about how you can honor me. Just a little, little short conversation, nothing really long and strenuous. When you honor me, you honor Jesus. This is important. It's important because... Christian culture in times past has done a poor job of teaching us balance. Yes. It teaches us to run away from pride and arrogance. Uh -huh. But it taught us so much how to run from pride and arrogance, it didn't teach us a quality, healthy level of esteem. Uh -huh. All right? So here's one of my personal issues I've spent so much time running from pride, but low self-esteem had me. I didn't see myself as God saw me. There was this imbalance in my life. And he says, so when you honor me, you honor Jesus. So when you honor me, I ain't telling you to stop no more. Because God sees that as you honoring him. Because I'm his sent one. When you honor me, you honor him. I ain't telling you to stop no more. I might tell you that makes me feel uncomfortable. Like, all right, chill out. Bring that down just a little bit. Or I might tell you not, not right now. This room isn't fit for that. Mm. Some places that I go, I know it ain't time for that. These some hood brothers, they don't know nothing about that and I don't need it that bad. Ministry is the most important thing right now. So let's just say that for church. Out here in these streets, it is what it is. Let's go get it. See what we can make. When you honor me, you honor Jesus, number one. Number two, when you honor me, you receive a reward from him. To be absolutely honest, I've been hesitant by allowing some of you to honor me because in some cases, it comes with reciprocation. And I don't like owing Negroes nothing. Can I get a witness in this room? I don't like owing nobody nothing. So until I know that your motives are pure, I need you to hold on to that. Because what you're not going to do is walk around like you did something for me. Nah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm funny acting. <laughs> I'm, fu I'm funny about that so I'm, I'm slow on that but at the same time I'm realizing that when you honor me I don't have to feel guilty because you left empty it's his responsibility to reward you not mine 
So don't get mad at me about a conversation you should be having with God. So number one, when you honor me, you honor Jesus. Number two, when you honor me, you receive a reward from him. Number three, maybe most importantly for me, when you honor me, you bring me relief. When you honor me, you bring me relief. I've never, ever, in eight years of ministry, and this isn't a good thing, this was part of my problem, I've never sat anybody down and had conversation of how you can best serve me. I've never done it. But I should have done it. Because there are certain people, especially in the private areas, when they serve me, they bring me relief. I'll give you an example. So uh, this, this right here on the top of my head, everybody can't handle this. My mom and daddy look at me like, you going to cut that anytime? They just don't understand it. They don't understand it. There's sometimes I, I just want to go to the low, the low fade and the 360 waves. I want a baby to put a hat on again. They don't even make hats big enough for this right here. I want a baby to put a hat on again. And it just, you know, I go to the barbershop every four or five days to get a lineup. Because when this starts getting out of line, people start seeing you as something you're not. So you one of them. You one of them. Oh, you so you a preacher and a gangster. Cause because gangsters. So you start getting all these accusations. So so imagine me getting up on Sunday morning having to sponge all of this. I'm taking 30 minutes out of time that I could be finalizing a message, trying to do my best to sponge all of this. So one of our partners, who's my barber, he honors me enough to say, PT, this is what we're going to do. I want you to get a barber chair. I want you to put it in your office. And if you can show up every Sunday morning within a reasonable time frame, I'm going to give you a fresh haircut on Sunday morning. So while he's working me over, I'm finalizing my lesson. He's relieving stress. For some people, you being grand. No, he's relieving stress from me. So one less thing I have to worry about is my hair when I get up in the morning. And this takes a lot. <laughs> you don't understand. This takes a lot. Sometimes he washes my hair and he's like, is the water hot? I'm like, I don't know. I don't feel it. It ain't made it down to my scalp yet. There's a lot going on up here. He relieves pressure. So sometimes when you honor me, it's simply relieving pressure. Some of you who come and you put a, a gift in my hand, man. God bless you. I, re I, receive it. I receive it so much. A lot of times the gift doesn't even make it home, to be honest. There's this pretty little girl with this nice little sundress on about three persons back just salivating, coming from Kid City. When I get a PT, I'm going to give him the biggest hug. And in my mind, because she's the daughter I never had, when she gets to me, I'm going to empty my wallet. <laughs> That's why I don't carry any money. I spend my mortgage on these little girls right here. Now, I love the boys, but going on, they ashy and everything. <laughs> Something about these little girls. <laughs> when, when you honor me, you relieve stress. Every time you put something in my hand, it helps to relieve stress. It's a little something else to go in my tank. I don't have to worry about that. It's a little something else that might go on a bill. I don't have to worry about that. Have you noticed one of the biggest changes in this ministry in the last two years? Have you noticed? PT, you've been preaching at another level. You have been on fire. Like week after week, you don't miss. You know why? Because you relieve stress. You said you no longer have to go to a nine to five. This is your nine to five. It relieves stress. So now I can do ministry work and by the time my children get home, I can be a father like everybody else, be a husband and chase my wife around like everybody else and work gets done. This level of honor helped to relieve stress in my life. And I thank you for that. Watch this. Let's go a little bit further. The Bible says in Hebrews 13 and 17, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that your work will be a joy, not a burden, for that, you will be, for that will be of no benefit for you. When you call me your pastor, but you cause me headache, it is of no value to you. Have you ever, 
Have you ever been out somewhere and your phone went off and you looked at it like, oh, Lord, Jesus. Oh, Lord. I don't even, uh -uh, not right now. I ain't got time for that right I can't even put up that right now. Okay. Here's what you don't want. You don't want that to be my response when you call. Oh, Lord. What is she complaining about? She didn't like the blood. She wanted near the cross. Oh, my God. Why is she calling me about that? Oh, my God. You don't, you, don't, you don't want that to be my response concerning you. You want my pastoring and covering you to be a joy. You want me to go to my time in prayer and say, Lord, keep them. Not Lord, kill them. <laughs> Watch this. The Bible says in a message translation, be responsive to your pastoral leaders. Listen to their counsel. They are alert to the condition of your lives and work under the strict supervision of God. Contribute to the joy of their leadership, not in drudgery. Why would you want to make things harder for them? This is what George Mueller says, and I quote, the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day was to have my soul happy in the Lord. The first thing to be concerned about was not how much I might serve the Lord, how I might glorify the Lord, but how I might get my soul into a happy state and how my inner man might be nourished. So if there were a takeaway for today, it would sound like this. Pastors, seek the people's joy. People, seek the pastor's joy and grow your joy in Jesus together. I want to see you living in joy. You should want to see me living in joy and we grow and seek in and after God's joy together. Are you with me? So watch this. There is this sad misnomer that the church simply desires your money. This mentality has become prevalent in this culture. And the issue is this mentality doesn't transfer equally in every aspect of your life. We go to church and all we hear is all that church wants is your money. But when was the last time you went to the mall and said, belts, all you want is my money. Now, I'm going to tell you, all they want and they not lying. That's why when you get up to the cash register and stuff you never plan to buy ends up in your car because it's a convenient grab. You know what? I didn't even know I needed that lotion, but since it's right here, go ahead and put that in the cart too. Compression socks? What? All right, let me try those out. It's convenient because they want to strategically get your money. We say it about church. We don't say it about the mall. When's the last time you went and got your oil changed? They took about, um, excuse me, I need to talk to you. No, you don't. Change my oil. That's all I want. Change my oil. Is it free? Is the windshield wipe fluid free? If it ain't free, we don't need to talk. Change my oil, I'm going home. I let my uncle fix the rest of it. I just came here for an oil change. Because at those places, all they want is your money. But here's the problem. When you go to a restaurant, when you go to a mall, when you go to a car dealership and you give them your money, you justify the exchange because of what you needed. Okay? I don't mind paying that at the, at the, uh, at the uh, department store because I needed it. I don't mind paying that at the restaurant because I needed it. I don't mind paying that on my car because I needed it. So what that communicates is your lack of a need for the things of God. It's not that you don't tithe because you don't trust pastors. You don't tithe because you don't need God. 
It's not that you don't give because you don't know what's going on with the money. You don't give because you don't see yet where I need God. And what you don't want is for God to have to orchestrate a season in your life just to prove what he already knew, that you can't make it without me. You're fine now because your baby's in good health, but you do know that that could change in the twinkling of an eye. And let's see then how you gonna make it without me. When your marriage is fine, everything's straight. I don't need God, but end up on rocky terrain and let's see how much you pray then. I don't want you to be in a place where life has to teach you that you need him. I'm telling you, you need him. As the deer panteth by the water, so my soul longs after you. I need him for my peace of mind. You know what? I want you to, I want you to stay tuned. We got a lot coming up in the month of October. One of the things I'm also going to add in in the month of October is I'm going to add in a night of prayer. I'm going to add in a night of prayer, not because I want us to get prayer practice. I'm going to add in a night of prayer because sometimes I don't need to really talk to him. I just need to get at his feet and cry. I can't do it at the job because they're going to think I'm crazy. I can't do it at home because my children go wondering what's going on. So can you get me in a room where there ain't nobody asking me a bunch of questions and don't nobody need me to do nothing, but it's okay for me to climb under my chair and say, Lord, I need you. I can't make it without you. I need you. I try to do it on my own, but I need you. Ladies and gentlemen, the idea that these places not wanting our money shifts cognitively in believing the above are justified and they meet our critical needs. So let me be the first to say that not only do you need God, you need church. You need a spiritual family and everything that goes along with it. Something you need to concretize before it's too late is who is your pastor? I would hate for something to happen to you and your family reaches me about doing your funeral and I'm thinking, I'm their pastor? I, I didn't know that. Oh, so they a partner at the city church. I thought they was over there. Oh, they were committed to Bedroom Baptist. But they ain't no bishops at Bedroom Baptist. They ain't no pastors at St. Matthew's Cathedral. So you need to concretize in your life, who is my man and woman of God? So when life hits, there is no confusion. You got to concretize who your spiritual family is. Why? Why? Because where there's no honor produces no reward. And where there's little honor, there's little to small reward. But where there's full honor, full honor releases a full reward. So Pastor T, you've taken us the last four weeks, including week five, where our team did an awesome job in collaboration on last week. You've taken us through these weeks of incredible teaching. It's been mind-blowing. Ain't nobody going to say amen. Amen. (laughs) I'm telling y'all, your lack of honor is something special. I mean, I just don't understand. And and, and the the, the the teaching has been so impactful. And Pastor T, I mean... They honor me with their lips. (laughs) All right. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you. Thank you. Because he shows set y'all up for this one. All right. So this is what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor. So what does that mean? It means 
everything I've taught you about honor from week one to today, when it comes to me, you got to double it. Two times over. This is what the Bible says. You trust me these last few weeks, give me another chance to swing at it. The Bible says the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who labor and the preaching and the teaching. Why? Because it is overseeing your soul. Watch this. So the Bible says that those who direct the affairs of the church are worthy of double honor, especially those who, whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain and the worker deserves his wages. Why is this important? Because this communicates, this ain't got nothing to do with a preacher getting money. Let's work back to front. It says the worker deserves his wages. So when payday comes at your job, I want your supervisor to say, God bless you. Or there's a fruit basket in the staff room for you. Stay healthy and stay whole. And let's see, you, you'll remember some scripture then. No, 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 no. The labor is worthy of his hire. Huh? Huh? You see how it works then? All right? It works. It's just a natural principle for the plumber, for the mechanic, and the preacher. Watch this. He says, and do not muzzle the mouth of the ox. Why is this important? All right. This is actually a, 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 a retelling again of a principle in the book of Deuteronomy. This is in the law where he says, if you're going to use the ox to tread your field, then don't muzzle his mouth. Part of, part of his working is being able to eat from the ground that he turns. It's, 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 it's only right. So the Bible even pulls that to say when the preacher is using the word to change his life and yours, then even he should be, he or she should be able to eat from the ground that becomes fruitful as a result of the seed that has been sown. Everybody with me? So this is what he said last but not least. He says, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor to be treated with respect, partly, but it also communicates to you are worthy of double wages. If you study it out, this is what it means. It means you don't, you, you, you don't just deserve a check. You should get two of them. Somebody's like, where do I sign up? You better be careful. You better be slow with that. He says, those who do the work of the Lord, especially relative to pastoring and teaching, they are worthy of double honor. All right. So in these last few minutes, give us some elevated music. I want to give you some practical ways wherein you can honor me. Write these down. If you don't write these down, it's dishonorable. Uh, number one, you can honor me by praying for me. I'm not talking about no praying hand emojis. I'm really talking about when you get up in the morning saying, Lord, keep my man and woman of God. When you lay your head down at night, say, Lord, keep my man and woman of God. Pray for wisdom, for clarity, for compassion, and for clear vision. Number two, you can honor me by encouraging, encouraging me. Encouraging meaning to lift your leaders in public and when necessary, critique in private. Some of you, some of you are not being able to walk in a place of blessing because you haven't apologized for what you said in public. You roast me on Saturday, but jump in my prayer line on Sunday. I'm telling you, I'm not mad. When I leave here, I'm going to get some good sleep and some good eat. I'm not mad. I'm just trying to figure out why is it every time I pray over them, they don't see no increase. I'm, I'm extending my faith for God to rain heaven and open up windows. And every time I pray, you always come back still broke. At some point, I have to realize it ain't because he don't hear me. 
It's because there's something going on between you and him. You need to go talk to him. Are you still with me? Number one, pray for me. Number two, encourage me. Number, number three, serve. Pastor T, I believe in your vision. So what team are you on? What, what, what team are you on? You believe in the vision, but you won't help it go forward? Pastor T, I love you. Do you tithe? Because you know part of your tithe and offering is to make sure that my family eats. So your inability to tithe is more than just, I don't believe in it. You're saying you don't care what happens to my family. You don't care if I vacation or not. I could care less if your three boys eat today. That's what you communicate when you say, Pastor, I love you, but not that much to sow into the vision. Are you still with me? Am I still your pastor? Here we go. Number four, I want you to trust me. Trust me. Trust me. Put stock in the fact that I have your best interest at mine all the time. Trust me. Um, when you have all the information and when you don't, trust me that every decision I make has you at heart. I was, uh, you guys have seen this situation going on with the Boston Celtics. And uh, I mean, all right, let me just get to it. Um, I had my own opinion about this situation. I had my own opinion. Um, there was a sportscaster, TV personality podcaster by the name of, uh, 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 um, um, name escapes me, um, uh, Matt Barnes. Matt Barnes um, he used to play with the Lakers, a few other NBA teams. Now he's a sportscaster, et cetera. And he put up his thoughts by way of video. Uh, hour, two hours later, he took the video down. The next day, he puts up another video and says, guys and ladies, I'm sorry. Um, yesterday, I shared my thoughts, and I didn't know the full story. After I posted this video, I had a friend of mine who's an insider with the Boston Celtics called me and gave me the story. So I had to take down my video and put up my new thoughts. And my new thoughts are, it's deeper than you think. I'm praying for everybody involved and I have nothing else to say. His thoughts. When he got the full story, it's deeper than you know. I'm praying for everybody involved. I have nothing else to say. Sometimes when you don't know something, your first response is to speak. And you're going to put yourself in a position to have to come back and retract. It was deeper than I thought. I didn't have all the information and I ain't going to say nothing else about the matter. When your pa listen, I do this for a living. People pay me well to talk, to coach, and to encourage. So when a natural talker, gifted talker goes quiet, it's for a reason. And when you put your mouth on what you don't know, you make yourself look crazy and you show dishonor. But you, so you don't trust, you trust me with everything else but that. So this is the one area I'm going to drop the ball on as if my entire ministry and profession isn't hanging in the balance. Good morning to you. Watch this. Um, number five, we're on number five. All right. I want you to understand Understand, learn me, know what drives me, know what, learn what motivates me, know what, learn what frustrates me and lean into the things that motivate me and, and try to avoid the things that frustrate me. These same things can be applied in your home. We're on number six, protect me. Always have my back. 
I'm not one of them pastors. If somebody say something about me, I need you to get in the street, go fight. It ain't that serious. Um, this is where you can help me, though. Like, if someone in your circle is speaking negative, negatively against me, it could help me just for you to choose a side. Say something. Listen, I don't understand. I, I don't have all the details, but he's still my pastor. So be careful what you say now. Be, 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 be careful. You do know I don't have to come in here. Be careful what you say. He's still my pastor. Are you still with me? Last but not least, I want you to release me. When I say release me, I mean give me permission to lead you. Who am I to you? It's important. Because for everybody in this room, I'm not your pastor. For some of you, I'm your motivational speaker. So I never hold you accountable. Because you're not looking for accountability. You're only looking for inspiration and encouragement. But if I'm your pastor, then let me give you this word. And when I see you in error, let me hold you accountable to it without question. If I'm your pastor, I see what you don't see. When I see people get hit by life, it hurts me just like you. But you know what helps me to sleep better? When I know God sent a warning. When God sends warning, I'm going to sleep. This wasn't just about ignorance. This was about your desire to do your own thing. So this is now between you and him. I'm going, I'm going to sleep. So release me to pastor you. Release me to speak over you. Release me to communicate in you what I see that you don't even see. Pastor, I, I, I don't get it. Keep living. Trust my voice. Keep living. Just keep living. And I'm not always talking negative stuff. I've had some people, um, listen, I want you to work on this, work on this, work on this. I'm going to use your voice one day. Pastor, I ain't no preacher. I ain't looking for preachers. I'm looking for communicators. I can tell you what to say if you can just make your subject and verb agree. We're we, we not going to have that church where all the other preachers, they got word, just don't know how to say it. Uh, duh, uh, duh, duh, uh, duh, uh. Not here, not here. Mm -mm. Give me communicators. I can give you a lesson. If you can follow my lesson, we're going to work together. Are you with me? Why is this important, ladies and gentlemen? Honor is an international form of currency. Honor is an international form of currency. Honor is an international form of currency that the Western world, especially the United States, knows little about. When you see missionaries go into foreign countries and they're performing miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, why can they perform such miracles in places like that but not here? Because you can only receive from me what you see in me. And oftentimes we have too much to honor people at that level. Um, there was this uh, U.S. missionary who went over in the foreign land. He just wanted to touch the people, take some pictures. It would look good on Instagram. Um, he wasn't really trying to do no dirty work, but he didn't know where he was going. He ends up in this foreign land and the local spiritual leader could sense it on him. Like your motives aren't even pure. So that he walks him out in the center of the street while he's out in the center of the street. They're looking amongst the city and people are broken, busted, disgusted, flies in the water. There's food shortage. People are just 
And out of nowhere, these people begin to come out of their homes and just make a huge circle out of these two men. And the missionary from the U.S. didn't know what to do. And the local leader says, just stand there for a second. Don't say anything. Just stand there. And he stands there and he's nervous. And everybody's looking. And they're looking him in his eye. And he's getting uncomfortable. And then the local leader says, uh, you got a word? He says, well, I didn't come prepared. He says, but the Lord is leading me to tell you to speak. So speak to the people, man of God. He stands there for a minute because he has nothing to say. Because the typical lines we use in the U.S. don't work internationally. I'm believing in 30 days God's going to send you a fresh water pipeline. We've been waiting on two years for fresh water and you're going to hit us with that fake prophecy? You don't have, he didn't know what to say. He was flabbergasted standing there with everyone looking. And he goes back to something he had totally forgotten. He thought it didn't carry much weight. And he looks these people in their eye and says, God loves you. God has not forgotten about you. God thinks well of you and still has you on his mind. And the people fell on the floor and cried and wept like revival had hit the room. Because this is what world Christianity looks like. In many cases, the faith we practice doesn't work in other countries. But we have to ensure that everything we do relative to our faith makes us a world Christian, not a worldly Christian. Can your application of scripture work in whatever land you go to? We're so concerned about the menial things that don't matter much. It doesn't. Why are we still fussing about that? Why are we still worried about that for? When people are dying, people are starving, people are sick, and they need to know the hope that comes through the good news of Jesus Christ. You do know this is supposed to be good news. Stand on your feet all across the room.